Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Maria, and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. Two weeks ago, Russian President Vladimir Putin commanded an invasion of Ukraine in a major escalation of the Russo-Ukrainian War and in the largest conventional military attack in Europe since World War II. As Ezra Klein of the New York Times wrote, Ukraine represents the values of the West, or at least the values the West claims to hold made manifest. As a majority of the world watches on and condemns the actions of President Vladimir Putin, countless nations have expressed their support for the Ukrainian, pe the Ukrainian people, whether it be through monetary donations, halting business relations in Russia, or issuing sanctions and boycotts against Russian companies. Over two million Ukrainians have now fled their homes, marking the fastest growing refugee crisis in the world since World War II. Tonight's guest, Dr. Fiona Hill, one of the world's foremost experts on European and Russian affairs, intelligence, and security issues, will discuss these and other pressing topics, including global nationalism and populism, in a conversation moderated by Professor Hilary Apple, the Podlick Family Professor of Government and the George R. Roberts Fellow here at Claremont McKenna College. Dr. Hill has researched and published extensively on issues related to Russia, the Caucasus, Central Asia, regional conflicts, energy, and strategic issues. Her books with Brookings Senior Fellow Clifford Gaddy, The Siberian Curse, How Communist Planners Left Russia Out in the Cold, was published by Brookings Institution Press in 2003. And her monograph, Energy Empire, Oil, Gas, and Russia's Revival, was published by the London Foreign Policy Center in 2004. The first edition of Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, was published by Brookings Institution Press in December 2013, also with Clifford Gaddy. Dr. Hill holds a Master's in Soviet Studies and a Doctorate in History from Harvard University, where she was a Frank Knox Fellow. She also holds a Master's in Russian and Modern History from St. Andrews University in Scotland, and has pursued studies at Moscow's Maurice Thores Institute of Foreign Languages. Over the course of her professional life, Dr. Hill has worked in the research department at the John F. Kennedy School of Government and at the National Intelligence Council as a National Intelligence Analyst of Russia and Eurasia. Dr. Hill was also an intelligence analyst under Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama from 2006 to 2009. She was appointed by President Donald Trump in 2017 as a Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on his National Security Council staff. Hill is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and is on the Board of Trustees of the Eurasia Foundation. Dr. Hill is the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies 2022 Arthur Adams Family Distinguished Lecturer. Her visit is also co-sponsored by the Lecture in Diplomacy and International Security in honor of George F. Kennan. Finally, Dr. Fiona Hill is also one of CMC's 75th Anniversary Distinguished Speakers. Her conversation tonight with Professor Apple will highlight issues in unity and division, one of the three academic collaboration themes of our special 75th anniversary celebration. And now before we can begin, we do have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Please take a moment now, if you haven't yet, to put on your mask and ensure that it is properly fitted over your nose and mouth. Please also take a second now to silence and put away your cell phones. We will have a Q&A period at the end of the talk, so if you'd like to take notes, uh, now is a good time to take out a pencil and a piece of paper. And as always, remember that video and audio recordings are strictly prohibited. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Fiona Hill to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just so thrilled to have this opportunity to have this private one-on-one -on -one conversation yeah. with <laughs> Dr. Hill, whose work I've been admiring for so long. So first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. I know this is an extraordinarily busy time for you. I also want to thank Pete and Becky Adams for their generosity to the Keck Center and helping support this very special uh, evening that we have to really think deeply about <coughs> uh, the war in Ukraine right now. So I have a series of questions. We've organized it this evening, so this will be a conversation, a discussion, and of course, very soon, a Q&A so that we have an opportunity to hear from the students directly. So my first question to you comes exactly from uh, interactions I've had in class with students who said to me, Professor Apple, couldn't all of this have been avoided if the United States had just offered the written guarantees 
that President Putin had asked for in terms of banning Ukraine from NATO and not stationing any troops in Eastern Europe uh, in the new NATO uh, member states. And my response has been, well, in fact, there was really no likelihood that Ukraine was going to be joining NATO anytime soon. And in fact, um, you know, there are so many reasons, but not least of all, because it doesn't control its own territory, its own borders. It, it is really just a pretext for war. And of course, all the other pretexts that we've heard about denazification of Ukraine also are preposterous. They're not explanations for this war. So my first question to you is, why did Russia invade Ukraine? What was it trying to achieve? <clears throat> well, first of all, um, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be with everyone tonight and um, seconding your thanks to everybody who made this possible. It's really just wonderful to be here. It's wonderful and sunny, quite different from being in Washington, D.C. And um, anyway, this is um, a great opportunity for me as well to have a chance to, to talk to everyone. I've thoroughly enjoyed all the discussions I've had all day with students, so thank you very much. Um, and this is, of course, you know, the, the major question that everybody has been grappling with. And I want to say, first of all, that Russia per se hasn't done this. Mm -hmm. This is a decision made by one man and a small group around him, Vladimir Putin. And a lot has, it, has to do with the way that he thinks about the world mm -hmm. and the way that the group immediately around him think about the world as well. And it has its roots um, in history. In fact, if we listen enough to Putin and read um, some of uh, the things that he's been writing and saying, now he may not have been writing some of these essays that he's produced, he's obviously had somebody else writing them for him. I just can't imagine him sitting, typing away on his laptop, you know, someone in the Kremlin, I could be wrong, but in any case, <laughs> I think it's unlikely that he's actually written them himself, although this might reflect very much his thinking. He would even have us go back into the depths of history to the 17th century, when, you know, as he told George W. Bush very famously in 2008, part of the Ukraine or the lands of Ukraine were given to uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. He's basically said that Ukraine isn't really a country at all, part of it's in Eastern Europe. The reference to part of it being given um, uh, to Russia actually does go back to 1667 and the Treaty of Andrusova. Go and look it up on Wikipedia. One of my professors from St. Andrews in Scotland wrote me a note saying it all started in 1667, so it wasn't there to at all. You know, obviously he, he wanted to make sure I'd been paying attention in class. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's now sitting at Ohio State University with a bit too much time on his hands, I think. But in any case, uh, Putin has got uh, his own view of what this is all about. NATO certainly comes into it, but as you're suggesting, there's a lot more to it than that. And if it was so simple as uh, NATO, then I don't think we'd be in the position that we are today. Putin clearly believes uh, that there needs to be some kind of reversal of the consequences of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I mean, all of you have heard that he said um, famously, you know, back um, in the early 2000s, but has repeated this, that the greatest catastrophe geopolitically um, was the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 20th century. But he's also then referred to the collapse of the Russian Empire in the earlier period. And on the eve of uh, the invasion, and um, you know, in the course of uh, events that have happened, he's also gone back and blamed Vladimir Lenin. Now, obviously, NATO wasn't around in the time of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Um, he's talked about uh, Lenin kind of creating an artificial republic of Ukraine uh, to dilute um, Russia and uh, the, uh, the Russian Republic in terms of the Soviet Union, which is sort of true, but again, taken out of uh, a larger context. And um, he has, as you mentioned as well, um, also provided this pretext that the Ukrainian leadership, specifically Volodymyr Zelensky, the president, is the head of a neo-fascist, neo-Nazi um, cabal, uh, which uh, in itself is all kinds of convoluted and rather, uh, well, let's just say, well, it sounds nuts, frankly, um, when one thinks actually about the, the Ukrainian leadership. And that um, he is uh, basically also trying to kind of reverse uh, this extremist group that have taken uh, charge of Ukraine. So everything is all muddled together. And if it was so simple as just extracting out of their NATO, um, you know, obviously, as you said, this could have been avoided, but it's all the other things that he's freighted on top of it. Now, there is a debate 
I think I mentioned to you in discussion a little earlier today that there are you know, some of my colleagues in the um, intelligence community of the past who also think that if something had been done on NATO that this could have been avoided. But again, Putin's own view of history, the whole way that he's talked about it, suggests that that is not entirely the case. And it's not just about whether we reversed um, uh, Ukraine's uh, offer to become uh, part of NATO in 2008, but it's also going back even further to the expansion of NATO to other countries in Eastern Europe. So before it was even contemplated uh, that Ukraine might possibly have a, uh, an option to become a member of NATO, uh, Putin obviously had a pretty dark view about NATO expansion itself. And as you're very well aware, in December of uh, 2021, on the 17th, there were two documents submitted to NATO and to the United States in which the, the demand about Ukraine not being in NATO was made, and also Georgia and other uh, former Soviet republics. But there was also a demand that NATO roll itself back uh, to um, the period of 1997, which is before the expansion to Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary, so before the very first expansion, and to a period when NATO and Russia uh, basically created a, a consultative council. And also the idea of the United States pulling back weapons and missiles and placements in Europe um, since that period. So again, if, if it was just as simple as Ukraine not being in NATO, why is it that Putin is putting forward all of these other demands and muddying the waters? And, and I do think you know, that unfortunately, it's all of these things uh, combined. And Putin has been looking for pretexts all along to move into Ukraine and to pull it back into Russia's orbit. And there are many other things that we could talk about that I think really bolster that. So we're in a very difficult position because there's so many different threads of this. There's a lot of complexity. It's actually difficult, difficult to explain it. It's difficult to, difficult to keep up with all of the uh, various rhetoric and frameworks that Putin puts around of it. Mm -hmm. But it's not as simple as just having an agreement on the part of Ukraine that it will not be a member of NATO. Mm -hmm. All right, so in a sense, when we think about Putin, rather than thinking about this as Russia's war, but as Putin's war, so if we do that, I would say that for so many years, Putin has been given credit for being this brilliant tactician, right? That he plays a weak hand very well, that he's two steps ahead of his rival, that he's so brilliant. But clearly, in this case, he has miscalculated, right? He's Absolutely. miscalculated. <clears throat> the response of the Ukrainians who have been resisting, who've been resilient, who've been fighting back. The uh, Russian military has been underperforming, including the special forces. The West has been united and strong in its response. Uh, the economic consequences are severe. The Russian ruble is uh, 140 rubles to the dollar. The stock market remains closed. McDonald's is closed, Ikea is closed, Coca-Cola is pulling out, Shell is apologizing for buying oil. We are now boycotting oil. The Europeans are moving away from uh, their reliance on oil as quickly as possible. So to Putin, why did he miscalculate so substantially? What was his framework for thinking about uh, what it would take, what this challenge entailed in Ukraine? Now, we, do, we know from um, recent visits, including most recently the Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, um, I read an article in Haaretz um, just a couple of days ago, that Putin says everything is going according to plan. Mm. So he does not believe right now that he is miscalculated, but I'm going to address that question. And part of it is because he has always said that nothing goes according to plan. Um, you know, being um, an operative, um, that was the title of the, the book that um, Clifford Gaddy and I wrote about Putin, Operative in the Kremlin. He has these broad strategic goals and he always gives himself lots of contingencies, mm -hmm. you know, different options for trying to uh, basically achieve these goals. It's kind of like a broad-based strategy and then all kinds of different planning. Now, clearly, it's obvious to all of us that this can't have been the initial plan. But Putin's view is that then, while well, you learn from the mistakes and you adapt, and if you start you know, reading interviews with people in the newspaper you know, right now as well, you'll see analysts you know, like myself and others saying, well, you know, he's going to adapt, he's going to adjust here. Well, I'm sort of also wondering myself, well, how much you know, can you adjust if things keep on going as they are? 
So there's also there's always the option if the goals haven't changed and the goal of the subjugation of Ukraine, the decapitation of Ukraine, you know, basically meaning removing Zelensky and the leadership. Putin's view, you know, this gets back to your issue about miscalculating, is that leadership matters. He is a believer in the great man theory and that if you kind of change the leadership, you change the country. So one of the reasons why he's miscalculated is he doesn't understand that there's all kinds of people like all of you and all of us here. So we all have agency and we can all respond in different ways. And Ukraine is a kind of a horizontal networked uh, society. And in fact, one of the most confounding things about Ukraine and one of the reasons why he wants to inter intervene to you know, basically change the, um, the government is that Ukraine has always seemed to slip away from Russia's control, even historically. Because Ukrainians are not, you know, kind of under the sort of direct vertical of power like Russia is. Traditionally, the lands of Ukraine are the borderlands. They were the lands, you know, in which people fled to, to get away from the central authority of Muscovy in the um, uh, earlier periods of time. They're the lands of the Cossacks, you know, that we all kind of think about. They were run by a hetmanate, you know, basically kind of a confederation of Cossacks. There were free peasants who'd, you know, run away from serfdom. And then there were a whole mishmash of other peoples because Ukraine has been the lands in which um, uh, different um, empires have tried to move into. Polish, Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, the Swedish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire going one way, and other people going the other way. And Ukrainians have always had a very flexible identity. This was, of course, the lands of the Pale of Settlement during the Russian Empire, so a very large Jewish population, but um, Turkic. Greek around the, the coast, the Pontic Greeks. You know, basically Ukrainians had multiple fluid identities, Crimean Tatars are from the Turkic uh, period. And um, Zelensky is a, um, himself the president of Ukraine is an example of this as a Russian speaking Jew from Ukraine who um, doesn't you know, basically believe that either his religion or his language um, basically signifies his identity. And his family are from that place in Ukraine, probably going back centuries in the old pale of settlement of the Jewish uh, population that was you know, basically encouraged and forced at times to stay there by, un, by, the, by Moscow, St. Petersburg before it and the, and the Russian Empire. So Putin you know, clearly believes that um, just a change of leadership you know, will normally change things, doesn't understand that uh, there are different fluid identities that um, countries and peoples operate in, uh, in different ways. And he's probably not getting information back because of his vertical of power and the way that the system works in terms of he doesn't really get advice, he gets information. And because he was an operative in the old KGB, and the, um, uh, he probably doesn't have people like I used to be, which are analysts, in which we pull together all the old source information and we would kind of present it to them, you know, trying to give you kind of a coherent picture. Putin as an operative probably is the kind of person who gets sort of raw information. And, you know, at different points we've had our own presidents who have done that, our own kind of leadership. And when you're doing that, you're not synthesizing it. I mean, he does have people who provide reports and material for him, but he's probably getting a report from the military telling him one thing, or the intel people telling him another. And they're probably not at all telling him about, you know, how people are reacting on the ground. He may well think that things are going to according to plan. And of course, he's still got a lot of options open. Um, you and I were discussing mm -hmm. before the, 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 the mass of um, Russian military. Mm -hmm. So he's now deployed 100% of all these uh, uh, tactical groups um, that um, he had previously arrayed in Belarus and in Russia, uh, close to Ukrainian borders and in uh, Crimea. So far, he's only used about 5% of the kind of firepower and manpower. A lot of it seems to have got bogged down. And so he's got to figure out logistics and supply issues. But there's an awful more, lot more that he can throw at this. It's just the timing and the speed. And he's basically calculating and looking now based on the information that he's getting to try to think about how he can adapt. So when he tells Neftali Bennett that things are going to according to plan, he's really meaning that he's plans in terms of his goals haven't changed. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to kind of figure about contingency planning, because he, he's talked about this in the past, about what now he needs to do to reach his goals. Now, some of these could be pretty awful. And when Macron and others have said the worst is yet to come, they mean the kinds of things that we're seeing now, the bombardments. You know, we've seen what, you know, Russian forces have done in conjunction with Assad's forces in Syria, for example, with the leveling of, um, of uh, Aleppo and other major Syrian cities. Now, that was obviously not in 
an adjacent country, but we've seen inside of own, Russia's own territory, um, when uh, Maria um, was doing the introduction, talked about this being the largest military conflict in Europe since World War II, which is actually true because it's an invasion of another country. But the previously largest conflict in Europe after World War II was inside of Russia's own territory in Chechnya, uh, in which you know, there was the, the massive intervention from the center in a secessionist republic, the leveling of Grozny, and hundreds of thousands of casualties on both the Russian side and on the side of the civilian population, most of whom were Slavs and Russian speakers, not just Chechens. And so we can see that Putin has a ruthlessness mm. that um, you know, we, we have to factor in here, and that he is clearly then thinking about what is it going to take for him to basically decapitate uh, Ukraine in terms of getting rid of the current leadership and getting what he asked and demanded a few days into the conflict, which is the Ukrainian military to lay down their arms, to surrender, and basically overthrow their own government. So all the way along, he's made the demands that indicate as well what, he's, what he wants. But as you've rightly pointed out, it doesn't look like he's actually getting there because he, I'm not sure he's getting the information that we have. Mm -hmm. All right, well, this is, this is very worrisome because I heard you it say- It is, I mean, a, I'm worried, you know. You're saying 5%, so, yeah. right? There's, you said there's a lot more that he can throw at them. You've also said that he is ruthless and that is absolutely true. And I'll tell you that this is what keeps me up at night and I imagine you too and I imagine many people in this room, which is that I feel that Putin, the man, has so much to lose if he fails exactly. in Ukraine. So in other words, he, if he fails in Ukraine, he cannot survive as the Russian president. So then I think he will fight to the bitter end and he will use every weapon at his disposal to do so. And in a recent interview that many people have been talking about, you say that this would even include the use of uh, a tactical nuclear weapon. That is, uh, and that when Putin speaks, we should be listening. Right, So this really brings up two questions. First one is, can Putin survive this? Can he survive politically if he does retreat? That's the first question. And the second question is, given uh, the danger of escalation, what can the United States do to prevent this from turning in, you know, what is right now an invasion of one country of another into a nuclear catastrophe? Right, which is definitely what's keeping me up at night. I can't say I'm sleeping particularly well. <laughs> I'm sure no one else is either thinking about uh, all of this. But the, look, there are several things you know, that we have to factor in here. Now, you're absolutely right, this is Putin's war. This is a war of choice. The, this is the person who made that decision. He made it clear. You know, at sitting at a table the length of this room, um, you know, you've seen the kind of all the memes and the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, him at one end, you know, the rest of his team at the other. You know, we think this looks ridiculous, but he's signaling many things, not just that he's frightened of catching COVID. Uh, and there's a, the kind of a few Russian commentators said, is this a man who's really gonna start up a nuclear war if he's too frightened mm -hmm. about, you know, having his own, you know, kind of team, you know, kind of sitting close okay. to him. They've right. got a point. Okay. So we have to factor that in when I get to the second bit okay. of the question here. But what he's also showing with that ridiculous um, distance is that this is on him. And in fact, you know, all the staging of this makes it uh, clear that he's the decisive guy, he's the guy in charge, it's his war of choice, which we might think is, well, you know, that's a bit of a, you know, risk you're taking, you know, are you not gonna blame it on someone else? You know, basically, um, you know, how are you gonna get out of this one if it goes wrong? Mm -hmm. But it's also then showing that he has to double down, he has to um, push this to, you know, its logical conclusion. And obviously, as you said, he can't mm -hmm. afford to mm -hmm. lose. So he's going to try to spin this somewhere into a win. And given the way that the propaganda is being managed in mm -hmm. sort of Russia itself, there's a kind of like an iron dome of, uh, you know, all the way around, you know, Russia now with keeping information out. I mean, it's not complete, obviously, uh, but the, uh, you know, kind of the manipulation of the information space, the information war that Russia is conducting. I mean, he does have the opportunity to actually show the war as a success. You know, right before the war, when he was stationing and pre-positioning for this obvious invasion, you know, we saw the offensive exercises. He kept saying, now they're listening to me, now you're hearing me. And then he felt we weren't enough. And, you know, I do really think that a lot of the people who said he was bluffing, he wasn't going to do this, in a way it kind of egged him on. Mm 
because I've always you know, said about Putin from what I've uh, realized from studying him that he doesn't bluff. He's the kind of person who actually says to people, if I threaten, I deliver. I mean, he said that to the Georgians and others in the past. We always have to be extremely cautious about this and take things seriously because he wants some kind of response. And he made it very clear that as the United States and NATO weren't uh, listening to the demands or weren't responding to them, he kept saying this all the way along, that he was going to do something. Mm -hmm. And there's something, I mean, you and I have talked about this. Mm. I was shocked as well that he decided to go for full invasion. I wasn't surprised, but I was still shocked because it's, you know, when you actually see it mm. and there's somebody's actually done it, mm. you think, God, well, he really did do it. You know, we think he would, but there was always that hope that somebody else, maybe at the end of that long table, might give him, you know, some kind of reason to hesitate. Or he himself might have calculated going about this a different way. I mean, if I'd been him, mm -hmm. you know, even being ruthless and putting my ruthless hat on, I would have tried more of a kind of a, I, I mentioned it once before in an interview, a bow constrictor person, you know, just squeezing and crushing, you know, Ukraine, which he could very easily have done. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He decided to just go, you know, full in there. But he can actually say, and he can spin back to the population at home that, you know, he got us to the negotiating table. He showed the Ukrainians a lesson. He taught us all a lesson. It's going to be a bit hard to explain away the crushing impact of all the sanctions and all the pullouts of the... Um, economy, but he can always say, but see, as I told you, the West is against us, European is against us, they always want to bring us down, bring us to our knees, this is exactly what we're fighting against, and I've forced them to the table. But, you know, kind of, we're going to have to then figure out, do we create him a way out? You know, what we would call the golden bridge, you know, in um, the uh, kind of old theory of war, mm -hmm. Sun Tzu, and, you know, how you create a kind of an artful way out for an enemy because as you say, if he thinks that we're going to be in the basis of regime change, there is no way that he is going to pull right. back at any point because right. this is a man who was obsessed with watching the video of Colonel Gaddafi getting shot in uh, the drainage pipe when he was captured by rebels. Is a man who's actually openly said that those who lose get put against the wall and shot because he was watching the fall um, of um, you know, the, the communist bloc and what happened to Ceausescu, you know, his, his history, Mussolini, Hitler in the bunker, you know, so he's under no illusions here. Um, but he's got a tight group of people around him who made this decision with him and his military, who, you know, they all, you know, will hang together because they all made that decision together, even though he's the decisive person. And there's no way that they want to, you know, basically pull back and put any risk to themselves. So look, they could easily ca um, call martial law they could suspend elections that are coming up in 2024, and it could really tighten down even more than we're already seeing in terms of repression. Mm -hmm. So he has to be able to, we have to find a way of helping him to make face, uh, to save face rather, um, even if this is on a sort of a temporary basis to find a way out of this. And this is where mm -hmm. the whole issue of nuclear weapons comes in. Because you can be sure with Putin that he's trying to figure out how can he do this, the demonstration effect. And in some respects, he's already done it. So even before he'd invaded, he'd made a show of military strength, right? Mm. Because we were all absolutely alarmed by the hundred and however many it was, you know, thousands of men and tanks and RPGs and everything, planes and everything else that was amassed on the borders. Mm -hmm. And that really did get our attention. And now he's got our attention by, in a way, rhetorically going nuclear, by putting the forces on nuclear alert. Mm -hmm. It's not that easy um, to um, even use a battlefield nuke. I mean, a lot of my colleagues who look at this say, uh, look, they're in storage. We see them exercising with them, simulating, but it's not that simple. And also, they would have to do this in a contained way for demonstration effect. They'd have to have a pretext. You know, would they, there's a lot of things that would have to be contemplated there. They've already used Iskander missiles, which are nuclear capable, we think, you know, in terms of some of the cruise missile launches that they've uh, made. They're based in Kaliningrad. So he's already showing that he can do this. He's already shown that he's willing to do really nasty, ruthless, th ruthless things and to use unusual and cruel punishments. The use of polonium against Alexander Litvinenko in London, creating a dirty bomb, the first dirty bomb in human form. I mean, it's horrific what happened to Alexander Litvinenko. Mm. The poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in Salisbury with um, basically a weapons grade banned uh, nerve agent and spreading that all the way around Salisbury and leading to the death of Dawn Sturgis, a British woman, and enough of Novichok to kill 4,000 people in a perfume bottle, which was discarded in the donation box for a, a, a charity. I mean, when you start to think about all of this, then, you know, you realize 
that, and all the other things that um, <clears throat> he's ordered, including invasions, that you can be sure he's trying to figure out some way of escalating the situation so that we de-escalate. Because this is, he wants to get us to the negotiating table. He wants to change the conversation from being about Ukraine to about the future of nuclear war. So he's already got us talking about all of this. So what we have to continue to do is what the um, government has already been doing, the administration, which is not rise to the bait. We're not going on nuclear alert. We're trying to call, talk about this calmly. And we have to engage with the other nuclear powers and say, look, I mean, this will lead to the, um, you know, the t complete rupture of the non-proliferation regime, which mm -hmm. Russia has itself um, always wanted to protect, because that was up for renewal, um, you know, basically in the next uh, year or so. There was supposed to be a big conference coming up, I think even in August. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact timing at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And countries like China and other nuclear powers will not want to see Putin engage in successful military nuclear blackmail because if you're Japan and South Korea now sitting next to China and other countries you might think well this is great you know I can see now that the only way for me to protect ourselves is to have a nuclear weapon because it's unthinkable the idea of some kind of even proxy conflict between nuclear powers so Putin's changing all the calculus here mm -hmm. so I said we have to engage to kind of push back against that to make sure that it, it's seen as reprehensible and try mm -hmm. to head off any pretext mm -hmm. that Russia and Putin, let's just say Putin again, uh, may be trying to make about this. Well, I'm glad you raised China because I do want to bring China into this equation. So there are many things we could talk about it because we, we do know that he secured Chinese support or at least acquiescence for this, to some kind of activity in Ukraine. I'm not sure to what extent uh, he shared the full plan with President Xi, but I want to bring it in because I'm a little bit, I'm hoping just for you to provide some insight. So, I'm not, it's very hard for me to understand why uh, either, if you want to say President Putin, the Kremlin, Moscow, whatever you want to describe it as, fears uh, NATO expansion, uh, sees the West as such a threat, and does not feel that the rise of China will undermine its own interests. And there are a lot of reasons where you could think that it's willing to sacrifice certain interests in order to get the support of China in order to counter the West. I mean. There are a lot of reasons why China and Russia mm. should not get along as well as they are and not become partners, whether that's, you know, fighting for, you know, greater control over Central Asia, whether it has to do with the fact that Russia is losing market share in exports of military uh, weapons, whether it has to do with uh, the contested lands that uh, historically have been part of uh, China that are part of Russia or the difference in population sizes yep. along mm. their border. I mean, the list is not short of concerns yep. uh, mm. that should undermine uh, this perspective. But yet, it seems to me um, that Russia was, is willing to compromise on all of these interests, right? Whether, you know, all of these, the Arctic, all of these, you know, areas in order to gain the support of China to counter a threat from the West. I, I'd like your, your thoughts on why it is that this threat and these interests seem so compromised by what the West is doing, you know, and the rise of China doesn't seem like a threat to Russia. Yeah, I mean, you've laid it out perfectly. I mean, these are all the reasons why, you know, many of us looking at it from the Russian perspective, um, we're always somewhat skeptical about the kind of the depth of the relationship between Russia and China. I mean, obviously, um, I know, as you said, I mean, there's all these kind of tensions here. Uh, and, you know, many years ago, it seemed unlikely that we would be at this particular juncture where um, China and Russia seem so tightly fused together. For, the bromance. Yeah. I mean, it, and it seems to be obviously focused right. in on Xi and, and Putin, very personal. But, the, you know, there's, there's a lot more to this, um, for the relationship, obviously. Partly it's about us, the United States, uh, and, you know, more than anything else. I mean we've kind of pushed them together with policies. There's been the reaction to sanctions, you know, the kind of reaction to, mm -hmm. you know, many things the United States has done internationally. You know, we started to see a lot of bandwagging between China and the Russia at the United Nations. You know, clearly both seeing a, a shared interest in pushing back. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that wouldn't be sufficient in itself even either, if, given you know, all the things that you've laid out there. But I think part of it really is about Putin's own worldview 
and you know perhaps uh, she's as well you know they're kind of a, a similar sort of age there's been a lot written about this you know quite recently similar sort of perspectives on global affairs but for Putin it's th this, this viewpoint that we already started talking about about the way that he sees uh, the developments in the West and in Europe Putin is very much shaped by the Cold War and by his experiences yet again you know, of the kind of rise in his career in what was then the KGB and being stationed abroad in Dresden in East Germany during the whole kind of collapse of the Soviet bloc. And his feeling that the Soviet Union just sort of gave up the ghost and sort of disappeared. You know, he talks about the capital being Moscow being silent and not kind of really understanding why the Soviet Union did absolutely nothing to sort of save itself. And then seeing what he believes then is over time, the United States trying to take advantage of that sort of situation. And I, I think the turning point comes in 1999 uh, with, and this is where for China as well kind of comes in, the bombing of Belgrade by the United States and NATO. And of course, we accidentally bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade as well because of old maps and thinking it was something else, which is a pretty big strategic blunder. But this is the point when Putin <clears throat> and people around him in, in Russia saw NATO not as the defensive alliance that we'd been saying it was, but an offensive um, alliance. Mm -hmm. Because we were reacting to what Serbia was doing against the Kosovo Albanians, what had been done previously in Bosnia, Herzegovina, the whole collapse of Yugoslavia. It wasn't that there was an attack against a NATO member. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't an Article 5. And we've been telling you know, the Soviets throughout the whole Cold War that we were um, basically um, engaged in a sort of a defensive alliance that NATO would never attack mm -hmm. another country. And when the Russians saw that, they were like, hang on, didn't you just, you know, even through the Cold War, <clears throat> this was always a defensive alliance, and you've just attacked Belgrade. And we never gave them a good explanation for it from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And we should have been very attentive to that right from the beginning. And I was in St. Petersburg at the time. And I was at a conference, and every Russian reacted in shock. It didn't, didn't matter what their political perspective was, or their views about you know, the West. They were just completely flawed. And they said, well, if you could do that, you could bomb us. And we said, no, 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 of course we couldn't. Trying to explain that, look, we'd been pushed into this because we'd been inattentive. And then it, why was this a NATO um, operation? And then you know, Putin said this again, see NATO operations in Afghanistan. Well, that was when we, uh, as a result of an Article 5 trigger. But then, you know, Libya, Syria, and, you know, again, no, um, from their perspective, attack, Article 5-like attack. But, you know, because we were using um, NATO as a means of coordination, because, you know, we've, we've got all of these years of coordinating our military affairs. And so when you look at it from Putin's point of view, he starts to then just see NATO continuously in this light. Mm -hmm. And we should have been addressing that a bit more head on and you know, talking about it, constantly engaging on it. And then when, um, of course, Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary are the first to want to uh, join in NATO, it comes in 1999 as well, around that whole time where you've got the bombing of Belgrade, the wars in the Balkans, the intervention. And they've also got, in, in Russia, yet another iteration of the war in Chechnya. Um, we bombing um, Belgrade because of what they're doing to the Kosovo Albanians, which is part of the whole you know, collapse of the Soviet Union. Why then might we not bomb Moscow about what they're doing to the Chechens? They have people like Zbigniew Brzezinski and Alexander Haig, former very senior mm -hmm. officials, have got a committee to protect Chechnya. Um, you know, for all of you know, Putin and uh, people watching, this is all kind of comes together in kind of worrying that this is, so they talk themselves into it, but we don't talk them out of it. We, we don't really kind of communicate and keep engaging. We think the NATO Russia Council is enough, and we always think that they're going to kind of understand our perspective. We, we always have a bit of a failure of strategic empathy, of kind of fully mm -hmm. understanding and being able to mm -hmm. explain. We keep thinking, what's well, irrational? You know, why would they think that? And of course, from our perspective, it's irrational. We wouldn't even contemplate bombing Moscow. We never contemplated it. Mm -hmm. We think Belgrade was different, but they think, well, why? Mm -hmm. And of course, why did Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic want to be in NATO? Because they think about Russian intervention there. Mm -hmm. Hungary, 1956, Czechoslovakia, 1968, and Poland in the 1980s. And they make it clear that they're going into 
um, NATO because they wanted to be defended against Russia. And so Putin and the people around him all were saying, well, what's NATO against then? We can say, no, no, it's not against anything. It's for something. It's for cooperation. It's for our defense. They go, no, no, you must be against something because that's what they saw in the Cold War. And so it all just keeps kind of escalating in a way um, in terms of Putin and the people around him's reactions because it's the frame in which they always see this. Mm -hmm. So even though I said at the very beginning, this wasn't all just about NATO with Ukraine, their views on NATO have become really hardened mm -hmm. to the fact that they really believe that NATO is an offensive alliance mm -hmm. that is always directed against them. You know, there's uh, a lot and of... And them, by the way, is the guys around the Kremlin. I'm not sure that the vast right. way the Russians, right. you know, kind of, although in polling, there are always, you know, being fairly negative responses, mm -hmm. but I don't think people are thinking it through that, okay. to that extent. You know, something that we've been talking about with students during the day in our conversations at lunch, you know, it seems to me that we are all going to be worse off the longer this war goes on. And of course, a quick end could be the only thing we could hope for, but I don't see how that could happen. But I don't think it's only worse off in terms of the human tragedy in the narrower sense. Of course, the, the human tragedy in Ukraine has moved so many of us, of course, but I think the legacies of this war right. are much broader, much greater. This is a, a, a moment in history where a lot is going to change especially if this war drags on. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about some of the potential legacies of this, of this war. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately for everyone who is a student in this room, this is going to be one of those defining uh, moments in you know, the rest of your lives. I mean, 9-11 was that as well, but actually for many of you, you know, you're a bit too young for remembering that as well. I mean, you know, when you get to Hillary and I's age, you know, kind of, there's been a lot of these turning points and pivotal moments, unfortunately. But we're here again. But we're here again. We're still here. Uh, but this is definitely, many of those have shaped our um, decisions. I mean, you and I are the same sort of generation and we studied Russian because of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I started basically studying Russian because of the Euro missile crisis in the 1980s in a war scare where it looked like we were actually going to be in a nuclear exchange. I mean, I actually set out to try to understand why you know Russia wanted to blow us up in the 1980s and now I'm trying to explain why they might want to do it again in you know basically mm. 2022 which you know kind of I mean obviously I haven't got any closer to trying to stop that from happening I'm trying you know kind of but um, you know basically this is going to be reshaping uh, European um, security but it's got the global dimensions uh, emphasized by what we just talked about China um, that by the decision of President Xi, perhaps on not complete information, to seemingly side with um, President Putin on the eve of the war, you know, in the agreement and the statement in Beijing. And, you know, it's not entirely clear that President Xi fully processed what Putin was going to do. Maybe he thought it was going to be the boa constrictor, you know, kind of squeeze and crushing of Ukraine and didn't think there would be a full blown invasion and you know if there was maybe it'd be over in a couple of days and you know the Russians would be in and out and you know then we'd all see what was hap what would happen mm -hmm. but now you know all kinds of countries are going to be affected by this and looking at it we're already seeing Japan and uh, South Korea uh, behave in ways that we thought that they wouldn't do too in terms of pulling out of Russia ways that they had always um, resisted before because of their own separate relationships I, you know, I worry that as of this, we're going to see a lot more countries actually wanting nuclear weapons. Because it's not just, you know, the ability to engage in nuclear blackmail like North Korea and Iran, you know, of their neighbors or, or of uh, the rod of war, but out of protection. Because, you know, why has Ukraine been predated upon? Well, Ukraine inherited a nuclear arsenal back in the early 1990s, so did Belarus and Kazakhstan, and gave it up. I mean, obviously, this is the Soviet era arsenal. Uh, for um, deconstruction um, after getting guarantees of its independence, territorial integrity and sovereignty by the UK, Russia and the United States in uh, 1980, uh, 1994 in the Budapest Memorandum. Obviously that was useless. And you know, kind of now, you know, Ukraine will be, you know, searching around for security guarantees again, particularly if it agrees, you know, not to be in NATO, then how do you guarantee this given the fact that, you know, 1994 uh, didn't pan out. 
other countries are going to be looking at us and thinking, you know, we can't guarantee our own security. We're either going to have to have a buildup of conventional weaponry. We might have to engage in all kinds of other uh, coalitions, you know, defensive and um, maybe we all want to get nuclear weapons. And so again, the non-proliferation regime, you know, shifts. We've already had, you know, um, India and Pakistan. There's all kinds of territorial disputes now that um, depending on how this war ends, that could be either inflamed or, you know, certainly um, reshaped by um, the, the events. And then there's the economy and everything that we've seen here. Other countries looking at this and then thinking, well, could that happen to us? What are the implications of all of this? We're going to be basically rethinking supply chains. We've already had a lot of this um, under COVID. But you know, if we're pulling out of the Russian market, there's going to be all kinds of knock-in effects. Um, and you know, what about the, the human impact as well? And the way that all of our societies will change because you know, um, I think from uh, one of you said it's got to two million. I think Adrian, you were telling me over because I've, I've lost count now with the you know just been here for the day. I haven't been able to look at the news. You know, last time I looked, it was 1.5 million refugees. Now it's two million. You know, refugees. We've already got huge refugee flows. We've got to start thinking about this as a reality and something of the future. It's not just from wars, but from climate change. This is actually, I hope, going to be a jolt to people about getting back their humanity and their empathy for people who've been displaced. Because for Europe, they haven't had refugee flows like this from inside of Europe uh, mm -hmm. since World War II. So this is very different from people coming from conflicts that people can say, well, that's not happening here. I don't have to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And maybe the refugees can go away and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. This is happening you know, here and now in Europe. And there are millions of people, not just, you know, Ukrainians and Russians with relatives in Ukraine. I have relatives in Ukraine through extended family. My cousin's married to a Ukrainian from Kharkiv. And I have all kinds of close friends and, and other family members who, you know, have Russian in-laws and, you know, kind of uh, close friendships and extended families. And we're all gonna be affected mm -hmm. by this. You know, people in this room um, have family members and, you know, may themselves be from Ukraine and Russia. And this is going to affect all of us. And our societies are all going to have to kind of come to terms uh, with this, uh, this development and think about how we organize ourselves. This mobilization of effort in support of Ukraine will have knock-on effects as mm -hmm. well. And then there'll be the question of, you know, if and when the war stops, how about you rebuilding? And then what the implications then, we know we look at a country like Lebanon that's been devastated. Um, you know, how are we going to then, you know, think about other countries that have found themselves in similar situations, which are also going to be points of instability in, you know, the kind of larger environment. There's going to be a knock-on effects from, on food security. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's been reading about this, but this was the overlooked issue in the conflict in Ukraine up until just a few weeks ago. Um, not by myself and others, because we've always been tracking this but about the fact that Ukraine, Russia, and Kazakhstan are some of the world's largest grain producers and that the United States and Canada can't step in and compensate for that. They're already rationing sunflower oil in Europe because there are, I think something like 60% of sunflower oil in Europe came from Ukraine. So Lebanon, Yemen, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, there are all kinds of uh, Ethiopia, Countries now where there are wars and conflicts that are going to be deeply affected, the World Food Programme won't have enough resources, we're going to be looking at large-scale starvation as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just the trade and the exports, but it's also the planting season in Ukraine getting disrupted. You're not going to have many farmers out in the fields with tractors in the middle of you know, being shelled. You know, we're getting into that you know, kind of spring planting season as well. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of things that I haven't even yeah. thought about here, and the, but you will all be thinking about the digital world, um, you know, how this is going to be shaping our thinking about cyber, information war, propaganda, and you know, the, the roles of different generations. Volodymyr Zelensky, 44 years old, Ukrainian president, totally different generation from Vladimir Putin is going to be 70 in October. Mm -hmm. Totally different way of thinking about things. Ukrainians are already shaping you know, the kind of landscape about how you deal with a, an information war. Well, for my final question, I, I really wanted to ask a question about the book. Uh, we have a very full room. Many of these students are fortunate enough to have uh, a copy of your book right now. So thank you for that. Let me ask you a question. You write in the book um, about how people from your hometown in Northeast England really suffered when the coal mines 
closed, and they didn't see opportunities um, to replace them. And you see a lot of similarities between what happened in these mining areas to what happened in America's Rust Belt and also in post-Soviet Russia, that people feel they lack opportunity, uh, they feel left behind, and as a result of that, they have become more susceptible to populist leaders. Now, my original question was going to ask about how this uh, will affect or has affected the political systems in all three countries, but then we'll not get to the student question. So maybe I'm going to ask you, in terms of Russia, what has this meant for political evolution in Russia? Well, there's a number of aspects of this, and some of them get to what we've just been talking about in Ukraine. One is that um, the vast proportion of supporters of Vladimir Putin come from the old Soviet Rust Belt. Mm -hmm. Donbass is part of that, mm -hmm. as is Transnistria, um, Moldova, a lot mm -hmm. of the breakaway regions of uh, the um, former Soviet republics, uh, the, you know, the new modern countries, are the areas that were the sites of Soviet heavy industry and that were kind of built up after World War II and there was the um, encouragement of uh, particularly Russian speakers uh, to go and work there in big factories and in coal mines, steel works, you know, this kind of thing. The north of England, where I grew up, was very similar to that, although, you know, it was the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, uh, and English from different parts of the country would all kind of come into my area to work in the coal fields, the steel works, the wagon works for the railways, the shipyards, for example. And it was, you know, heavy industry in the north of England was also nationalized. So, I mean, I actually grew up in the kind of equivalent of a small Soviet statelet <laughs> without the central planning, but with the, you know, the heavy state-led industry. And, and it was privatization under Margaret Thatcher that tipped it over into mass unemployment and then leading into populist politics. And in, you know, kind of basically the Soviet Union after the collapse in Russia when it, the, there was the privatization under shock therapy, mass layoffs, um, you know, a lot of grievance, people feeling totally dislocated. They're the people who then vote for Putin in 1999, uh, 2000 to turn things around. And Donbass, uh, you know, th this area that, you know, people felt a lot of grievance there. The, the, the jobs in the coal mines are, 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 are dwindling down. Uh, there's not new investment in Donbass, it's all the Rust Belt industries. Uh, people are predominantly Russian speaking. Um, there's a kind of a yearning for how things were in the Soviet period when Donbass was pretty prosperous. And I have my own strange link to Donbass. Mm. When I went to university in 1984, I went there against the backdrop of the miners' strike in the UK, which was the largest um, industrial action in the UK after 1926, you know, through the whole, mm. you know, the economic upheavals there. And that was the end of mining, uh, pretty much in the most of Britain, but certainly in the north of England, all the mines closed down after that. Two years of uh, a, a huge strike. Miners had no money, and miners' unions from around the world raised money in support of the miners, including the miners of the Donbass and the Kuzbass in uh, Siberia. Wow. And that mo some of that money was put into a pot. Now, some cynics would say it was probably the KGB, or these really miners' unions, but I do think there was a lot of fellow feeling there, because mm -hmm. there were actually strikes in the Soviet Union, demonstrations in the labor uh, you know, organizations there at different points. And there have been actually in modern Russia as well, a lot of, even truckers have gone on strike in, in Russia. So it's not just Canada or the United States, you've, you've had this in uh, Russia as well. But this money from the mines of Donbass was put in a fund uh, by my local miners association in Durham. And I got some of that to go to study Russian for the very first time for a summer program, intensive summer program. So wow. the fact that I can uh, learn Russia was thanks to the miners of the Donbass. So I do feel a lot of you know, weight on this, but the miners mm -hmm. of the Donbass and others in the Donbass, in Transnistria and elsewhere, part of the reason that they were, how it was so easily manipulated by Russia is because they had a yearning for those times of the Soviet era when you know, basically everyone had a job and had a reasonable um, you know, kind of standard of living. And certainly in the northeast of England, everybody was yearning for a period, you know, in their view, which was sort of like the golden age. Now, that was very brief. In the northeast of England, it was probably the 1950s. My father was already always talking about the 1950s mm. being this kind of golden age for miners. It was when the mines had just been nationalized. There was a lot of money was put into them. It was in the whole period of rebuilding after World War II. But by the 60s, they all the mines start to close down again. So you've got a very brief period. And in the Soviet Union, that period was probably the 70s which is the period that Vladimir Putin, 
is really kind of coming of age. He's born in 1952, so in the 70s, in his 20s, he's studying. It's kind of like, you know, the golden period of his youth. He's kind of got all these extra jobs. You know, there was actually ability to have part-time jobs. He buys a car, or his parents buy him a car. He drives around, he goes to, you know, Crimea, he has holidays. And he's always kind of probably himself hankering back to that mm. golden period mm -hmm. of the Soviet time and making the connection with everybody else who feels like they've lost something. All of this is about loss of what's happening in Ukraine mm -hmm. on the part of Putin and some sets of Russians, not the gaining of something new. Whereas Ukrainians are all about, they gained a country. They don't want to go back to whatever this is that mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin wants to send them back to. 1667, 1977, they don't want it, thank you. All right, thank you. I, I could keep asking questions, but I promise you we will have a lot of student questions. So let's end there and open this up. Thank you. Dr. Hill and Professor Apple, thank you so much for the conversation tonight. And as a token of appreciation, I would like to present Dr. Hill with a oh. CMC commemorative token. This token is for our 75th anniversary as a thanks for being one of our speakers oh, um, and also commemorates our school's own military history. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's oh, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. And for our audience, tonight's Q&A period, um, because we have a little bit of a larger crowd than normal, Maya Ghosh and I will be walking over to you with the microphone instead of you coming to the front. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, we anticipate a lot of questions in the audience tonight, so when we come to you with the microphone, please be sure to keep your questions brief and also be sure to stand up and introduce yourself. You can raise your hands now. Hi, Dr. Hill. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Um, you know, obviously one of the hallmarks of sort of these big international events is the rally around the flag effect, effect of course. Um, you would know better than anyone as someone involved in an impeachment uh, trial that lately American polarization has been at an all-time high. How would you rate the American response to this event, and how important is that um, you know, when applying American foreign policy to countering Russia? Oh, that's a really great question. Because I do think that actually our parties on infighting and polarization was one of the factors that probably led to Putin's, what we think is a miscalculation. Mm. Because he didn't expect that there would be a unified response. He probably thought that actually, you know, some of the things that we're, you know, having, you know, right now, people blaming Biden, you know, is too weak. And this is exactly what Putin wants because he wants us to blame ourselves and you know, not react. And you know, Biden isn't invading Ukraine. It's Putin who's invading Ukraine and made the decision to do this. So I mean, all the responsibility is on Putin and making a decision. Um, so you know, getting you know, directly to that you know, point there, that Putin you know, would have expected this kind of thing. And as a result, would think that we were incapable of collective action. He thought there'd also probably be lots of recriminations from you know, Europeans, you know, the, the Italians, for example. They clearly um, anticipated that Italy and other countries with very strong um, economic relations and trade relations with Russia, Germany as well, uh, would kind of everybody would sort of be fighting with each other about this, pushing back against the idea of sanctions, and um, you know, basically. Uh, encouraging their governments to immediately negotiate with, um, uh, with, 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 the, with the Kremlin. And if you look back to 2008, that's exactly what happened when Russia invaded Georgia. There was immediately everybody, you know, kind of blaming each other, blaming Mikhail Saakashvili for, you know, kind of provoking the Russians. There was a bit of that, but, you know, kind of, uh, again, this was, you know, kind of a, a Russian invasion. And President Sarkozy of France dashing in immediately to try to you know, basically mm -hmm. conclude a ceasefire and then, you know, everybody went, try to go back to their business again. So this response has been, you know, remarkable. Now, has it papered over all of our divisions? Probably not. But I think it is also, you know, rather striking that we have, for the most part, had um, both sides of the aisle in Congress and in the Senate basically responding in a similar fashion that you know, notwithstanding some of the you know, political sniping back and forward, that we have to um, basically take strong concerted action. It has also been remarkable about the unity in 
um, Europe and in NATO about this and with other partners. And I think there's a couple of explanations for this. One is that we've always underreacted in the past mm -hmm. uh, when things have happened, and we've suddenly realized that you know, we've been telling ourselves stories to soothe ourselves about things that wouldn't happen and coming up with interpretations to explain away what has actually been a pretty clear pattern. You know, what you said before about, uh, you know, kind of, was this inevitable? I mean, we've seen something like this coming for a very long time, and he's already, you know, we've seen Putin invade Georgia, invade Ukraine before, intervene in Syria, all kinds of, you know, other patterns of behavior that, you know, should have pointed in a direction that we're dealing with a very serious situation. When the Biden administration made this decision to reveal all of the intelligence and, you know, kind of go out and talk to um, counterparts, there was a lot of pushback, a lot of skepticism. I mean, I myself uh, was on a lot of Zoom calls with the policy planning departments of other countries and finding that um, there was a great deal of suspicion about the United States intelligence. I mean, this happened when I um, was you know, in charge of dealing with all of this at the National Security Council as well after the poisoning of um, Sergei Skripal. There were some countries that were kind of skeptical that the Russians had done this. Uh, most of them were kind of countries that they didn't know that Novichok existed, and so it was a big deal that um, Theresa May actually told everybody that it was out there. A lot of people believe Russian propaganda, that, that this might have been done by someone else to make the Russians look bad. And, you know, the Russians have a whole history of disinformation that people fall into all the time. Remember when MH17, the Malaysian Airlines, was shot down, they said the CIA shot this down, the plane was full of corpses, all kinds of just ridiculous things, but there's just enough of people to create some kind of sense of doubt mm -hmm. about everything. And also, people um, looked at past mistakes that the United States has made with intelligence and, you know, manipulation of intelligence. Think 2003 in Iraq, and the French in particular, you know, kind of with that cloud of Iraq, when the French knew that um, Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction. And you, you might remember the you know, French president at the time kept repeatedly pushing back against the United States. You had a million people out in the streets of London protesting against you know, the war, the biggest you know, protest in you know, British history. Mm. There's a lot of, you know, kind of um, skepticism there about the intelligence. And of course, Secretary Blinken went out and said, look, the last time, yes, the intelligence you know, was being put out there to um, start a war, we admit it. But you know, this time, this is to stop a war. I think then the fact that actually the intelligence was correct has been a huge jolt. Mm -hmm. And so for all of the countries and all of the people who said, no, the United States is hysterical, I had that lot, you're warmongering, you're engaging in hyperbole, this is wrong, he's not going to do this. The fact that he, de he did has been a huge shock to the system. And it's also like we were talking about before, people are now looking at other Europeans who are being displaced in a major conflict as Maria said in the introduction, the largest you know, kind of conflict in um, uh, European history since World War II, notwithstanding Chechnya and other things that have been happening there. And it's a shock to the system because everybody's been telling themselves, you know, we, we get this in our history classes. We never, we're never going to do this again. We set up the United Nations. We set up all of these institutions to prevent this from happening. Mm. And yet it's happened. And you know, was it inevitable? Could we have stopped it? Now people are getting mobilized and into motion to try to push back against it. And that's you know, part of the reason why it's all gone beyond what anybody anticipated, because everybody has been individually shocked. I mean, we're all shocked every single day looking at this. And we can't say that this is at degrees of remoteness. Because as I said before, everybody, one way or another, is a degree of separation away from a Ukrainian or a Russian. And you know, being really shocked by this. And also seeing that the Russian people are going to suffer from this. And, that something you know, basically has to be done. And so I think we're all surprised. I think we've surprised ourselves. I was talking to a colleague who's in the State Department at senior level over the weekend. And they said, we never anticipated this kind of response. That we thought, based on the past, that we would have to do a lot more of strong arming. And now people have gone way beyond what we even thought. We, we, want, we have nothing left you know, to kind of hold in reserve you know, to basically negotiate with the Russians, there's kind of like we've gone, mm. and, and many things we can't pull back because of people's individual decisions. So it's not like the, you know, President Biden can order all the rest of us to not do some of the things that we're doing or to, you know, they, they can't, it's not Biden who's ordered McDonald's to, you know, kind of basically pull out or Ikea, 
This isn't part of the sanctions that we were thinking no. about. This is people basically saying this is unacceptable and I don't want to do business while this is happening there. Hello again, Dr. Oh, Hill. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering um, if you're at all concerned about Donald Trump's relevance in this whole uh, predicament right now. Hmm. Depends what you mean by relevance. Um, I mean, certainly Putin assumed that, you know, kind of given uh, Trump's rhetoric and, you know, what, what's happened in the United States over the last several years, that again gets back to that other kind of question about us being much weaker than we were before because we're fighting with each other all the time. And I, I, mean, I am concerned, I'll, I'll just be you know, quite frank, not just about what Trump is saying and Tucker Carlson and everybody else, but you know, when you're dealing with a, you know, um, a situation like this, it's not like rallying around the flag because I do hope that this isn't going to be used in sort of like a mobilization effect to, again, paper over our divisions. But this is just such an atrocious situation, so potentially catastrophic, it already is catastrophic, but the potential for escalation is so high that we have to get serious about dealing with it. And blaming other people for you know, basically being responsible or going through all kinds of bizarre counterfactuals is not very helpful for us for thinking about how we're gonna um, head out of this. I mean, you know, do we really you know, kind of care about what you know, Trump might have said or not said if a nuclear bomb goes off? I mean, it's basically we're trying to, at this particular point, prevent, you know, the kind of the escalation. So I'm worried about, you know, the kind of the partisan infighting, the performance of, you know, the political performances that we're sort of seeing, the you know, lack of responsibility um, in, in people's rhetoric, and, you know, the kind of this tendency that we always have to, you know, fall upon each other at times like this. Because, again, I think this is precisely why Putin thought he could get away with this. And so, you know, we need to be basically very clear that members of Congress, the Senate, our you know, whole political class need to be pulling together to try to find ways of stopping this war and making it very clear that this is unacceptable and trying to you know, then put on a kind of a collective front as, you know, as much as we can to engage with our allies and partners and others, I mean, who are not even our allies and partners, to try to get this to stop and to get it to contain. So that's where I'm obviously very worried about. And I'm worried about, you know, obviously, the midterms and you know our own presidential election if the war's still going on about how that could all feed into it mm. because we you know our own overall weakness as a as a polity has really definitely fed into this there's no there's no two questions about it you know in, in my mind Hi. Hi. Oh, something about the mics isn't it that um, yeah okay Hello, thank you so much for your talk. I had a quick question about how, you, like, uh, how much of the unified Western response do you attribute to the, ex like, the ex like the exposing of our interconnectedness over the past few years through COVID, as well as just like struggling Western economies on like the back end of COVID? I think you're right. I, I'm, I'm sure that that really has played a role as well. Um, I mean, I guess you know with. COVID, we've all been in this together, right? I mean, although we've all been having to be apart from each other, COVID has affected everybody um, one way or another, directly, indirectly. Um, it's been a global phenomenon. And as you said, we're a really interconnected world. I mean, there's a lot of unraveling now of some of the other interconnectedness economically. I mean, we've already seen global supply chains break down. Um, there's already been shifts that we haven't you know, fully processed. But as a result of all being kind of stuck at home, uh, we've started to use, I mean, I've been trying to stop my 15 year old from using social media, I had to give up because I was always trying to stop it, but we've all become, you know, kind of um, avid um, social media watchers and we've all become connected through Zoom, we're all having these kind of connections, you know, in ways that we didn't have before and that ultra connected world has played uh, a very important part, I think, in that all, we're all seeing what's happening there. Now, I'm saying we all, but not in Russia, obviously, uh, that's been highly sanitized. Uh, I think in China, they're seeing a, a, you know, a lot of different things, although I think China also interconnected as well, people, information's getting in, in in different ways. But I think you're absolutely right that the fact that we're all sort of seeing this in real time with our own eyes, we're getting you know, TikToks back, you know, FaceTime, 
we're getting you know people texting i mean i i'm uh, every i mean I, I can't even pick up my phone without getting some message back from the front you know my my cousin telling me about his father-in-law i was texting back and forward are they okay you know getting hearing about friends and trying to get people out people being constantly on the move i've got one um, friend who is in uh, in poland right now because she speaks multiple languages She's on the border there, translating for refugees. Every night she writes up a kind of like a diary and sends it back to all of her friends. So yes, it's all making us feel like we're part of it. And I, I think that you know that is one way in which the world will have changed after this as well. Maybe we won't just sit by and watch as people drown in the Mediterranean and you know kind of uh, get kind of stuck in places you know without people knowing. Maybe there'll be much more of a kind of a sense, particularly for, for you and others you know who are here with family connections around the world of feeling more of a sense of responsibility, I hope so, from all of this as well. We can't just turn away quite so easily as we could before. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Um, the median American voter will lose interest at some point, and you mentioned midterm elections coming up. I'm curious how long you think the political clock is uh, for American response, and with that in mind, what does effective and practical uh, American intervention look like? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, yeah, it's a fair assumption that we'll lose interest, but maybe not, right? Um, I mean, if you think about the Balkans um, and the Balkan Wars, interest and attention grew over time. Mm. And I mean, that was kind of in, indeed what, in fact, pushed for um, a US intervention. Mm. And I'm kind of a bit worried about that right now because there's a lot of an escalatory dynamic, dynamic here. You're already getting um, American um, servicemen um, who've been in Iraq and Afghanistan and are very worried about you know, the fact that they kind of, um, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of interviews, I've talked to people, feel like they abandoned Afghanistan, but now they might want to go in and do something for Ukraine. You know, the formation of international brigades, you know, the rumors that, and stories that the, the Russians are trying to recruit foreign fighters, this can, this can go on in all kinds of different ways. Ukrainians are going back into fight. All of us getting you know, pulled in different weapons. There's huge flows of weapons that are going into Ukraine right now from all, all kind of countries around Europe and elsewhere. So it, 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 more attention might get put on it. But as it, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, our political system will get into action at some point. And it, I think it's kind of a bit unpredictable about how this might affect the midterms. It gets back to that kind of question about how the rhetoric um, gets uh, shaped, whether it become permissible for people to kind of keep blaming, you know, other Americans for what is something which is clearly not, um, you know, kind of uh, the responsibility of our, you know, uh, political figures. And then um, getting back to your question about um, an intervention, what does it look like? Well, there is already the intervention in terms of military support um, done in coordination with. Um, NATO partners and others, although we're trying to keep this an individual country level, precisely because of the risk of mm -hmm. Russia and Putin reacting to what he sees as, as kind of then a NATO intervention by other means. But there's also the diplomatic effort. And this is where it's really tricky, and it gets back to some of the questions that we've been asking about, you know, kind of world opinion, people like all of us, you know, having a stake in this, companies, networks of individuals. And really about who can possibly talk to Putin in particular and you know kind of shape the thinking of the Kremlin and the, you know the people around him seeing you know for example the Israeli prime minister the Turkish president um, you know we keep on hoping that there maybe might be a change in the way that she and the you know the Chinese government look at it and you know might there be a change in the rhetoric um, I was asking uh, Professor Pei about this today, you know, trying to probe what does he think, because I mean, I'm not a China expert, I have more hope, I think, than a you know, realistic assessment of this, because, you know, kind of thinking about who can possibly have an impact here, and does that mean then, you know, uh, that the United States has to change the way that it interacts with China and other countries as well, in a kind of push to stop this from escalating? You know, how, I mean, an effective U.S. intervention would be a mixture of you know, what we're trying to do on the military side of things that might blunt, uh, you know, Russia's ability to prosecute the war to the fullest of extent, and a very serious international intervention where the United States is working in coordination with um, 
not just the United Nations, but countries you know, that go outside of Europe and the kind of our immediate alliances uh, to try to um, persuade Putin as much as anything else to stop the hostilities and then have a, a carefully framed, and I'm being very careful about this, what I say, because you know, the more we talk about regime change, the, the more we talk about economic war, the more we talk about a lot of the things that we're talking about now, the less likely we are to get Putin to the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. But so that how do you find a way out for him and what are the kind of the countries, what's the kind of configuration that would make that possible? And I think we're, we're grasping towards this right now. And that's why it's also very important to have a collective response and not to be fighting among ourselves at this time as well, because Putin will be getting all kinds of messages from our system and making calculations you know, based on what he sees about the lack of resolve or the lack of coordination mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of what he thinks, you know, kind of he can get away with, basically. So it's going to be very difficult. And again, it, uh, effective response really also has to involve diplomacy. Hello, thank you for coming to talk to us today. Um, to my understanding, Russia kind of exists as a petro regime and petro economy where much of Putin's support comes from the economic elites as well as the oligarchs in the country. Considering the economic repercussions of the sanctions imposed by the West and other countries as well, um, what do you think the implications of this are for the economics and oligarchs kind of like support for Putin um, in the regime? and kind of long-term implications of Putin's hold on the country? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, because, I mean, we haven't seen the full extent of it yet. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this very sudden pull out of um, um, every aspect of commerce from, we were talking about IKEA and McDonald's, that's a big shock to the average Russian. And, you know, Putin has been promising people um, improved living standards. I mean, part of the whole um, success of Putin over, you know, one of the reasons he's been there for 22 years has been because he's given people a much better, you know, living, um, a style of living, um, you know, kind of a, 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 in, in real terms as well, um, you know, their, their whole well-being than they've, they've had before. I mean, Russians have been living their best lives in the last... Um, you know, several decades. And I mean, I'm not saying that flippantly, I mean that in real terms as well. For a long time you had real incomes increasing, you know, wages were increasing. There's been, you know, some stagnation in, in recent time, but with the, an eye to the 2024 election, you know, Putin had been, you know, making a whole host of promises about, you know, what people, you know, were likely to be experiencing. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, cheap vacations for Russians. I mean, a lot of people were, of course, vacationing in Crimea or in Yalta and, you know, some of the, you know, Russian resorts and the uh, annexation of Crimea was as much about world holiday places, you know, as it was, uh, um, uh, as well as anything else. There's um, Turkey, Israel, Egypt, you know, a lot of tourists, uh, Russian tourists were going to. When you really kind of think about the number of Russians who were going out and, uh, and abroad, it was you know it wasn't actually huge numbers, about a million you know people or so in some estimates, but still you know there was a kind of a feeling of you know Russians writ large uh, that you know life was so much better than it had ever been before, um, unless you were involved in political opposition and then it was something else, but now that's not the case. And not only are you getting more political repression, but you're getting now suddenly everything disappearing overnight. And it looks now like the 1990s. The last time there was a default and a run on the ruble was 1998, which I happened to be there to see, and it wasn't pretty. Mm -hmm. And most Russians, you know, the younger generation, don't have any memory of that. And other Russians have forgotten it because 1998 is quite a long time ago. And it's that kind of economic shock that could really start to have repercussions. Because you're getting political protests right now, but Putin is absolutely terrified about economic protests. And the one times that Putin has really felt on edge have been in the early 2000s when he had pensioners out on the streets protesting mm -hmm. in large numbers because of the removal of their, their monetary benefits. And you know, one of the reasons that um, they tried to assassinate Alexei Navalny is because Alexei Navalny was running around in Siberia 
um, basically building a opposition, but there was a lot of opposition, not just on political reasons, but because people in um, Siberia and elsewhere, the Urals and out into the Russian Far East, were also feeling a bit of a pinch. Feeling it, all, all of the polling in Russia, uh, when people were asked what they were most concerned about, wasn't Ukraine, mm. or neo-Nazis and you know, all these other kinds of things that you know, Putin is kind of putting out there. It was all about bread and butter issues and about the economy and stagnation and you know, other kinds of things that we're all worried about as well, right? And so that is going to be a massive concern. And then, as you mentioned, there's all the business elites, uh, not just the elites who, you know, kind of, um, we all kind of think about the super rich with their yachts and um, palaces and everything like this. But, the, you know, the kind of business elites who are working in Western companies, uh, managers of companies, and then they've all lost their jobs. I mean, just with IKEA, 15,000 Russians will lose their jobs. And those weren't all, you know, kind of obviously managers, but people on the shop floor, McDonald's, these were all franchises. And you know, so you kind of go all the way up the chain. If all these big businesses, Shell, BP, are all pulling out, one of them had local Russian staff, and they'll lose their jobs as well. And then you know, people like Ruslan Abramovich are getting forced to sell Chelsea and you know, kind of divest themselves of you know various assets. And this will all build up. Now the people in and around the Kremlin who Putin relies on the security guys, they never had anything like that. They didn't have, well, I mean, they were a yacht maybe in the Black Sea, but. They didn't have all of these assets abroad. Their kids aren't studying abroad. You know, they were all the kind of guys who were thinking about autarky or thinking about their security and didn't get out and about that much. But that's a small group. All of the other people are going to be affected by this. And so how does that pressure get itself felt? Now, it's not going to be immediate. Um, it's going to be over the process of weeks and months. And it's also getting back to the kind of question about an effective you know, response to our part in diplomacy and how do we get out of this. A lot of that is not going to get repaired. I mean, once you kind of pull out with the, some of these big corporations, they tend to stay out. Uh, particularly the oil and gas sector, which is now a move to diversify away, they're not going to kind of come back. The car assembly plants and things like this, they will think about, well, they might go somewhere else. There'll be an impetus to go back into Ukraine and help rebuild Ukraine, but there won't be an impetus to go back into Russia. Some things, you know, there might be, and I would imagine IKEA and McDonald's and others, you know, might go back. But for some of these other businesses, they might have been already rethinking their positions. I know that my auto manufacturing were, and some of the oil and gas companies were as well, you know, wondering about the longer term and a lot of the kind of pressure, you know, to diversify. So a lot of the things that have now been pulled out, that's going to have a knock-on effect on the, the economy over a long period of time. Semiconductors, critical components of the defense sector, I don't think that stuff's going to go back either. So this is looking a bit bleak, and it actually also might reduce some of our leverage about, you know, kind of promises of restoration, because the government can't um, basically order, you know, companies to go back in. It's kind of easy to get, um, or, you know, easier to get them to go out. You can't just order them to go back in again. Please join me in giving Dr. Hill a warm oh, round of applause. Thank you.